Merci à vous en tout cas d'être parmi nous pour ce, ce moment qui promet d'être très intéressant. On a, avec nous la, on a la chance d'avoir avec nous aussi le docteur Nicolaos, qu'on remercie beaucoup. C'est une des grandes, grandes figures du, de, du traitement et du diagnostic de la maladie de Lyme en, en Europe et même, et même dans le monde. Je pense qu'on peut le dire sans problème. Euh, et donc, on va avoir une séance à la fois avec une présentation de la part de, du docteur Nicolaos et puis une, une, passe, une période pardon, assez longue de questions-réponses. Next slide, please, doctor. Oh, Frédéric. Um, yes. If you, can you put next slide on? Yep, I can. Okay. Right. Great. No. For, maybe. Okay. So, le sommaire. Je ferai quelques mots en anglais. Actually, I will speak a little bit English as well because we also have some um, English speaking uh, persons who, who signed up. Um, So, uh, le sommaire, on aura d'abord le parcours du docteur Carcel Nicolas, que je vais présenter rapidement. Et puis, le docteur prendra la main pour parler d'épidémiologie, de physiopathologie des infections, pour dire où on en est en 2024, pour donner un, une vision des diagnostics actuels, des options de traitement, pour comprendre le patient dans sa globalité, et c'est une clé importante. Et puis, pour... Euh, parler du, du manière plus général de guérir en considérant les cellules, les organes et les systèmes, en évaluant et en optimisant leurs fonctions. C'est un peu énigmatique, mais vous verrez, c'est très, très intéressant. On aura donc cette séance, cette session de questions-réponses qui durera, je pense, euh, au moins une demi-heure. On a déjà quelques questions qui sont venues de, de votre part. N'hésitez pas à en, en mettre un, également dans le chat pendant la, pendant la présentation. Alors, juste une petite précision sur les questions. Euh, il ne s'agit pas de faire une consultation à distance, hein, donc euh, poser des questions assez générales pour que la réponse puisse, euh, puisse être euh, intéressante pour tout le monde. Donc, le docteur, uh, again, uh, maybe in English for a second, if you have some questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but as I said in French, uh, please uh, keep general questions, not only your own questions uh, on your own case, uh, we are not here to, uh, as a you know, consultation, it's not a medical consultation, um, donc, le docteur Karsten Nikolaos, qui est docteur généraliste euh, du, du monde diplômé, il a fondé, vous le savez tous sans doute, la, la clinique BCA, et pas que la clinique, le groupe BCA qui comportait également la, le lab d'analyse BCA et euh, le, le laboratoire de recherche et la, la, la formation de, pardon, l'entité de, de formation de la BCA. Il est membre fondateur de l'Infectolabs Americas à Minneapolis. Il est membre de l'ILADS et de longue date et formateur de médecins. Vous savez, l'ILADS, c'est l'institut, enfin, c'est la, la, la l'institution qui, 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 qui comporte l'ensemble des médecins euh, Lyme en, dans le monde, enfin, qui comporte, pardon, qui, qui, qui réunit l'ensemble des médecins et des chercheurs Lyme dans le monde. Il a formé également des médecins, beaucoup de médecins, on le verra après. C'est un ancien membre du comité de direction de l'ILADEF, c'est-à-dire la fondation exécutive de, éducative pardon, de l'ILADS. Il a formé plus de 1500 docteurs depuis 2006. Il a soigné plus de 2, 25 000 patients Lyme et maladies vectorielles attiques venant de plus de 90 pays à ce jour. Et il continue à soigner des patients encore aujourd'hui. Il poursuit la formation et le coaching de docteurs au travers de collaborations cliniques dans le monde entier. Donc c'est un... C'est vraiment quelqu'un de très, très expérimenté qu'on qu qu a la chance d'avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui. Maybe in English for a second. I won't be detailing uh, Dr. Carsten's, uh, Nicolaus' uh, CV, but as you see, he's been a member of very important uh, institutions like the ILADS, the ILADF. He's been the founder of the BCA group in Germany, which is the historical uh, a clinic and lab in, in, in Germany, and not only in Germany, but in Europe, I would say, at large uh, for, for Lyme, as you may know. And he's been training so far 1,500 doctors, and he's been um, treating uh, more than 25,000 patients. Yeah. Uh, merci de couper votre, uh, vos micros, Isabelle Lequerre, par exemple. Merci. Thank you so much. So, 
Dr. Nicholas, the floor is, the floor is yours, so feel very free to speak uh, in English because normally the subtitles should be working, donc les, les sous-titres devraient fonctionner. On, on, on espère que le système va bien marcher. Carson, this is... So it's, I guess it's my turn now. So, Frédéric, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon and a very warm welcome uh, from London to uh, everyone um, attending my uh, presentation tonight. So a couple of weeks ago when I met Frederick in Germany at the European Islets meeting, I was very excited uh, being approached um, for this uh, tonight's webinar. And um, you can be sure I will do my very best uh, to share with you some hopefully important information. So, um, um, so um, if you can see in the following 30 minutes. Afterwards, I'm very happy to answer uh, many of your questions and hopefully there are a lot of them. And uh, now um, I want to start and uh, going into more details. So, you know, uh, this was the headline last year, uh, uh, relatively early in springtime at the time in the Times magazine. So uh, the worst tick year than ever. And, you know, uh, looking uh, to all the publication announcement this year in 2024, uh, it looks like um, that it's becoming even worse. So uh, finally, um, I'm getting a lot of report, uh, reports from uh, different European countries at the moment. Uh, that there's a huge rise um, of tick-borne diseases. So specifically, um, uh, their first announcement uh, about uh, uh, Lyme borreliosis. Uh, secondly, a lot of uh, um, announcement about huge increase of uh, TBE, tick-borne encephalitis, which is the viral infection, which can be transmitted by ticks, which you will see a bit later in my presentation. And um, so um, I just want to point out um, uh, it's still an ongoing problem, and uh, based on many, many different reasons, um, we can expect uh, furthermore a huge rise of these tick-borne diseases, uh, but I will come to that uh, more specifically during my presentation. Um, so finally, um, I want to give you some epidemiological data, and this is a relative recent um, uh, 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 publication um, so when it came up that the most um, uh, often seen uh, vector or tick here in Europe is, uh, is the ex uh, Exodus rhizinus tick, so specifically in the western part of Europe. Um, and uh, more in the eastern part of Europe, close to the Russian um, uh, Belarus or Ukrainian border, we see some overlapping with exoded uh, persilcatos. Um, uh, they are quite similar, these ticks, and they are uh, most of the time responsible for the transmission of tick-borne diseases here in Europe. So on average, um, we can say um, that uh, there is a prevalence uh, of Borrelia in these ticks uh, in Europe um, of about 13.7%, uh, uh, but that can differ uh, from country to country or from area to area. So sometimes uh, in so-called high endemic area, it could be nearly 50%, and in others, uh, we see less um, uh, presence of Borrelia in the ticks. And um, on the other hand, it's also important to know at that point that uh, the NIMS are more dangerous for us humans uh, than the adult ticks. So uh, we are suggesting that around about 70% of all infection at the moment uh, will be uh, transmitted uh, by, uh, by the intermediate state, the so-called NIMS, which is only a tiny, uh, a tiny tick. So just one or 1.2 millimeters uh, at, at size and uh, very often uh, not noticed um, after the attachment or transmission um, um, uh, of uh, infectious diseases. So, um, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Karsten, for a second. Just go back to previous slide. Yeah, sorry, you know, I, I kept the, the English slide, but here is the French one. So, just en deux mots, c'est le, le slide en français. Effectivement, la, les nymphes des tiques sont principalement responsables de la transmission de Borrelia à l'homme, environ 70%. C'est ça quand même le, le grand message de, de ces analyses et que la prévoyance moyenne de l'infection à Borrelia chez les tiques en Europe est de 13,7 en français. Sorry, Carson. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So, 
Okay, so let's talk a bit about the incidence of uh, Lyme disease in Europe. And uh, you see um, uh, on this slide um, uh, how uh, um, uh, it will show up in the different European countries. And, um, you know, unfortunately, there's a very high uh, incidence of tick-borne diseases, specifically in France, um, um, and um, uh, compared to other European countries. And uh, if you look um, more detailed into the different areas, you see also some differences. So they are uh, uh, very hot spots, so specifically in the middle um, of um, uh, of your country, um, but uh, it's all over a big problem, and uh, um, even more than in other European countries. Um, this is a very important um, uh, number I'm now presenting. You know, last year the WHO um, have uh, uh, presented a study. So this was uh, finally a summary out of um, um, at the beginning more than four thousand different studies worldwide, and um, uh, finally eighty nine studies um, had been included in the meta analysis and. Um, this was very, um, uh, very surprising on one hand and very impressive uh, uh, numbers uh, when I read this article. So um, uh, summarizing, so now um, it's uh, well approved that um, uh, around the world, 14.5% um, uh, 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 of all people are carrying um, Borrelia burgdorferi antibodies. So that means that one out of seven uh, people worldwide um, are suffer from Lyme disease. And this is definitely solid and uh, solid data. And uh, this gives you an overview um, how widespread it, um, Lyme disease is and uh, how important um, uh, it's becoming. And uh, so uh, based on these numbers, uh, it's not anymore, uh, anymore understandable that there are still countries um, uh, which are denying the, uh, the existing of these uh, infectious diseases, specifically when it comes to chronic stages. So um, some 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 picture to relax you a bit more. So you know these are the most common ticks here in Europe. So as I said before, the Exodus retinus tick um, uh, is definitely of most importance. But in some areas, we are also seeing more and more dermacenter uh, ticks. So specifically in the eastern part, the balcony. But there's in general a uh, um, uh, south to north trend um, and widespread of these. Uh, different um, uh, ticks. Uh, in some more um, southern parts of Europe uh, and countries of Europe, uh, you have also seen, uh, you are also um, uh, seen um, from time to time in some local area problem with the brown talk, uh, dog tick. Um, uh, uh, at the moment, not in the northern part or um, uh, only in the southern part, so specifically uh, around the Mediterranean area. Um, so, um, Looking more specific into the different uh, 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 tick uh, species, um, um, so uh, as I said before, Ixodes uh, uh, is the most common one. Um, Ixodes uh, retinus, Ixodes capillaris um, is uh, more seen in the U.S. and Persocatus, as I said, uh, in the eastern part of Europe, and then uh, further more uh, east. Um, uh, going uh, more and more to uh, to uh, the Asian countries, then you will see a lot of Ixodes persilcatus. Um, beside of that, the brown dog tick I have mentioned, Dermacenter uh, in different uh, species, so the sheep ticks uh, in the southern part of Europe, um, uh, the alluvial forest ticks um, are playing a major role. And in some countries, we have also seen some Asian um, uh, ticks or exotic ticks like Hyaloma and Amblyoma uh, more and more. So Hyaloma uh, was confirmed a couple of years in certain areas of Spain, specifically in the outskirts of Madrid, the capital of Spain. Um, but uh, meanwhile, in, um, in half of the uh, states in Germany, uh, they have also found Hyaloma ticks. So this is um, from origin, uh, a tick from Asia and responsible for other tick-borne diseases, which are not playing um, a role in big numbers at the moment, but 
um, one of these infectious diseases uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, which can be transmitted by hyaloma is the Crimean Congo uh, hemorrhagic fever. And you know, um, this is um, a very dangerous um, uh, viral infection transmitted by ticks. And um, based on the climate change and global warming, um, we, uh, we can expect somewhere in the future some more and more problems, that's for sure. And uh, the other ones, the leather ticks or argus, um, are not so much of interest here in Europe, but you never know uh, what will happen in the future. Um, so let's talk about the uh, most common infectious diseases which are uh, transmitted by these uh, uh, certain tick species. So um, as I mentioned before, Exodus, um, specifically in different parts of Middle, or, uh, middle Europe, are uh, uh, transmitting viral infections or the tick-borne encephalitis, um, uh, which was uh, seen for ages specifically in the Alpine parts of Europe, so in Austria, Switzerland, parts of France um, and Germany. Um, but meanwhile, um, there's a widespread uh, and a trend from the south to the north. And um, in many, many areas uh, of north, uh, uh, northern Europe, you will find more and more little hotspots of uh, TBE. Um, and um, probably this trend will go on. From the bacteria infection, which are most often transmitted, Lyme disease um, is definitely the one uh, which is seen most often. And, um, and uh, many of you or most of the people are aware about Lyme borreliosis, but there are plenty of other bacteria infection, um, the so-called co-infection, which can be transmitted by, at the same time, like Ehrlichia anaplasma, uh, Bartonella, Rickettsia, uh, and Tularemia, uh, for example. And uh, last but not least, uh, um, uh, there can be also transmission of protozoal or parasitic infection like Babesia uh, in different species or pyroplasma uh, infection. Um, so um, uh, the other more tropical uh, ticks, uh, like the leather ticks, they are most often responsible for some of the tick-borne relapsing fevers. Um, there's one uh, exemption here in Europe. And um, uh, so this is Borrelia miyamotoi, which is um, found meanwhile in any of the European countries. Um, uh, miyamotoi can be also transmitted um, by exodus ticks. So these are uh, the typical host of ticks um, uh, and um, uh, all these wild and farm and domestic animals are definitely playing a role um, in the widespread of uh, tick-borne diseases. And, uh, but uh, even here in Europe, we have also some uh, exotic animals uh, like lizards, for example, and even snakes uh, who could um, have um, uh, um, uh, their part in transmission of uh, as vectors in transmission of tick-borne diseases, uh, finally. And they are very exotic ones. So uh, since a couple of years, we are aware that in the Antarctic area, um, uh, so in uh, King's penguins, um, they have found a Borrelia antibodies, uh, for example. And uh, for the Arctic area or polar area, um, uh, we see also a lot of evidence of uh, tick-borne diseases in uh, polar bears, polar foxes, and uh, there's even in these cold areas a widespread of uh, tick-borne diseases. So the reason for this uh, tremendous wi um, widespread in the past uh, uh, two or three decades is bird migration. So typically um, uh, birds in springtime are coming back um, via the Eastern route or the Western route from Africa uh, on their way back to Europe. And in autumn, uh, it's going in the other way uh, uh, back. Um, so um, the, the birds are picking up uh, at the places um, where they are resting, uh, the ticks um, and uh, wire um, uh, the long travels, ticks can be carried over wide distances. Um, and this is uh, when I meant uh, there's a trend uh, from the South in Europe to the North, even in the polar areas of Europe, um, a very big widespread uh, based on uh, bird migration. So um, now um, I come to the more important part of my presentation. So where we are, at the moment uh, regard, uh, in uh, 2024. And, um, you know, um, 
there there is a certain meaning of um, um, uh, of uh, tick-borne diseases. Uh, so specifically, um, uh, biologists are uh, very wor worried about the trend. Uh, they have noticed uh, for the last couple of years. Um, so many of the tick uh, species are expanding uh, their range, um, uh, becoming more numerous and picking up uh, new pathogens. Um, so, and it's also important to know that ticks are transmitting more types of uh, pathogens like bacteria, viruses from animal to humans than any other living creature. And, uh, you know, um, there had been found uh, uh, of uh, ticks um, enclosed in amber, and uh, they had been dated uh, to be around about between 100 and 150 million years old. So I guess this is also um, uh, explaining um, that ticks have, um, um, regarding evolution, um, uh, a lot of advantages compared to humans. So they have definitely learned to survive over uh, millions of years, while um, humans are not as old as the ticks. And, um, uh, and uh, you can imagine what does it mean. Um, there is... There's another uh, good reason why ticks are transmitting so many different diseases uh, compared to other vectors, because uh, ticks are living for a much longer time compared to other uh, other vectors, let's say uh, some insects like uh, mosquitoes, uh, horseflies, sandflies, which are also um, able to transmit tick-borne diseases. Um, so in the, in the uh, recent decades, decades, Lyme disease have definitely uh, much increased. And um, so the, the researchers um, are still saying that um, probably uh, the numbers which are presented in all these epidemiological data um, are definitely um, far too low. And um, in most of the countries, the reported numbers are underscored. So it looks like that the problem is much bigger than it looks like at the moment. And, you know, uh, probably um, in the future, the climate change, the climate change um, is uh, contributing more for the expansion of the tick habitats. Um, and um, so we can expect definitely a lot more problems and uh, also the rising temperature uh, accelerating the life cycles of ticks, for example. So uh, in some areas where we do not have uh, any more uh, the three year life cycle of ticks. So, um, um, so it is shortened on two years and this contributes also to much higher numbers of living ticks and um, 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 we are generally more exposed uh, to these um, uh, big risk. So, um, so what are regarding diagnostics? So before we are talking uh, about treatment, we should be focused on diagnostics. And um, and you know, um, there are definitely uh, a lot of problems when it comes to diagnostics. Um, so. We have to take uh, uh, in account that uh, some of the test systems uh, which are used um, uh, are definitely not the best ones, and they uh, can fail quite often. And um, we have also to take in consideration um, that uh, we are not dealing any longer with um, uh, with mono infection. So, and you know, we have been too for too long um, uh, focused. Um, on uh, only on Lyme, and it's not every uh, every time uh, a Lyme. So we have to take in consideration that most of the time, meanwhile, we are talking about multi-infectious diseases syndrome. So that means, and part of these multi-infectious uh, syndromes uh, could be the bacterial infection I have mentioned before, all the different tick-borne diseases um, we are dealing with. Uh, also some um, uh, infection, bacterial infection with a so-called opportunistic uh, bacterial infection like mycoplasma and chlamydia uh, pneumoniae, um, all the parasitic infection at the same time like babesia, pyroplasma and toxoplasma infection. Some could be fungal and some could be viral. Um, so in most of our patients at the same time, um, uh, learning from the diagnostic that uh, Lyme disease is present, we see also reactivation 
of a certain viral infection. Most often it could be uh, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, um, uh, Coxsackie, or the other common ones. And um, this was multiple times published in the past couple of years um, that uh, we shouldn't be only focused on Lyme. We have to take in consideration these multi-infectious um, uh, 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 infection syndromes. Um, so when it comes to diagnostic, we have different types of uh, getting to a diagnosis. Um, so in most of the countries uh, in Europe, but also worldwide, uh, there's a legal requirement to go for the two-tier testing, starting with an uh, ELISA test, uh, which is unfortunately not very accurate. And you can swip a coin coming to the same um, outcome of the testing. It's uh, a roundabout failure quote of 50%. Uh, according um, uh, minimum seven studies, we can rely on. Um, if the uh, in the first round of testing, if there's a positive uh, outcome uh, for um, uh, Borrelia IgG or IgM antibodies, um, labs are obliged to run for confirmation purposes a second one, the so-called Western or immunoblot, uh, which is definitely much more accurate. Uh, beside of this uh, test system, uh, in some countries, there are still um, the offer of so-called C6 peptide ELISA testings. Um, there's an uh, option to go for early spot um, uh, testing for Borrelia and its co-infection. Uh, the CD57 uh, could be of interest uh, to get right from the beginning any idea about chronicity um, or chronic stages of these tick-borne diseases. Um, um, and all of these test systems I have mentioned so far are indirect test systems. Um, uh, we can also rely um, on direct uh, confirmation of presence of these pathogens. So that could be done in, uh, in blood, that could be done in other body fluids, so like the uh, cerebrospinal fluid or out of tissues. Uh, we can look for the uh, DNA of certain pathogens like Borrelia and the other ones. Um, and uh, last but not least, we can also uh, try uh, to culture first uh, the pathogens uh, before then uh, uh, going for certain types of confirmation and PCR testing or, uh, or others. Uh, beside of that, uh, in the future, we will definitely have more opportunities based on next generation testing. Um, uh, one of these uh, uh, subtypes of testing, uh, PCR testing, is the phage testing, which is also quite common in France and other European countries. And, um, in the US uh, at the moment, we have some other options um, of uh, fluorescence tests like the FISH test. Um, and uh, there's another lab offering uh, also um, uh, a testing with immunofluorescence to make uh, the DNA, uh, mRNA, or D uh, 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 better visible and um, uh, coming um, as soon as possible to a, a good diagnosis. Um, so, but there are also uh, some uh, some obstacles um, uh, when we go for the testing, and uh, you know, um, uh, very often uh, there are uh, made mistakes right from the beginning. For example, uh, someone has a, a, a noticed a tick bite um, uh, is going to his local GP. The GP is removing the tick and is uh, immediately going for blood draw. So this is sometimes also one of the problems specifically uh, for the required two tier testing. Um, uh, our immune system after the contact needs some time to, uh, to build up uh, antibodies. So this um, is uh, part of the B lymphocytic system. So, um, and that requires a time range minimum of 10 to uh, 14 days. So uh, if the blood draw is too early, it could lead to seronegative uh, results. So it's better than um, uh, uh, to start first treatment and to do the testing uh, with some delay after around about two weeks uh, to come to more proper and more reliable uh, test results. Um, uh, another very often mistake, and I, meant, I pointed out that it is so important to take care for the uh, multiple infection we see uh, in more than 90%, I would say in more than 95% of our patients, not to test only for Borrelia. 
Um, so um, uh, there, there's a huge bunch of co-infection at the same time, um, uh, which is also of importance. And this uh, knowledge um, uh, and uh, information um, is needed um, when it comes to treatment, which I will point out a bit later in a couple of minutes. And um, please also acknowledge seronegativity in the first round of testing does not exclude the presence of some of these pathogens. There are many, many obstacles uh, which can lead to seronegativity. I just want to point out uh, any forms of immunosuppression, for example, can lead to seronegative results. Um, uh, uh, and uh, people are really ill with these infectious diseases. So uh, seronegativity, again, does not rule out the presence of the pathogens. And um, last but not least, um, there's the selection of unsuitable test procedures, which can also lead to a bad outcome of the testings. Um, so, you know, in my past 30 to 35 years, uh, I'm now meanwhile focused on tick-borne diseases. Um, I made my own uh, learning curve. And, um, you know, um, so some of my learnings was that many of these conventional um, uh, approaches just um, uh, after getting a diagnosis to start with antibiotics is definitely not the best way in dealing with uh, tick-borne diseases. So we have to acknowledge that um, uh, specifically in chronic stages, um, it's, um, it's a very complex situation uh, with a lot of other accompanying uh, health condition at the same time uh, beside the presence um, of the bacteria which, which will have impact um, into the outcome, into the treatment, and finally the outcome of the testing. And, uh, you know, all these uh, complex uh, illnesses are most often not considered or part of the official guidelines. So the guidelines are only focused on the pathogens and I uh, will say, so if there are IgM antibodies after acute uh, tick bite, you have to go on um, antibiotic A, B, C, um, and that's it. Um, uh, specifically in chronic stages, it uh, seems to be much more complicated. And this uh, very often requires a more holistic approach, um, a, a more holistic approach, uh, approach uh, regarding diagnostic as well as um, for the determination of the treatment. And um, be sure there's no more one size fits all treatment approaches. Um, the treatment is uh, uh, is becoming um, very, very individually. And um, uh, we have to take in consideration all the results uh, before uh, thinking about a good strategy, how to approach on one of the pathogens and all the accompanying um, health conditions. So uh, um, the treatment of acute infection is very promising. And uh, if you do that right, um, uh, right from the beginning, um, and then patients have really a very good chance of getting a very good um, and sustainable outcome, which is nearly 100% if, <clears throat> if it started at the right time with the right antibiotics. And then relatively short treatment um, uh, could lead to a very good outcome. So in the guidelines, it's mostly mentioned two to three weeks. Um, but um, I have learned um, uh, to treat even in acute stage my patients uh, as long as they are presenting any symptoms. So um, that means uh, uh, acute treatment could be also sometimes extended to four to six weeks if needed. Um, I'm not always going only on two weeks and um, uh, I wouldn't recommend that to others. Um, so, and um, it's also uh, sometimes um, a problem uh, to choose for the right antibiotics. So, you know, very often as one of the standard antibiotic uh, doxycycline is uh, recommended, but uh, there are definitely some others for um, uh, acute stages, which are minimum on the same level or even better. So in some areas, 
um, or in some countries, uh, we have problem with resistance against uh, some tetracyclines. This is something we have to consider. And we have also to consider uh, that antibiotics like uh, doxycycline um, have um, uh, sometimes big problems to pass the blood-brain barrier, specifically when uh, some of the pathogens have been able to enter the nerve system. Doxycycline is not everything. So there are others uh, which are uh, sometimes uh, better recommendable. So um, the treatment of uh, chronic stages um, is definitely even uh, more challenging and difficult. And, um, and you know, uh, we have to take in consideration uh, that uh, even sometimes um, uh, uh, after a long treatment, patient can still um, uh, present persistent symptoms, um, uh, which can be very severe and very dis uh, uh, disabling. Um, and, um, you know, um, sometimes it's a matter of definition what it is. So, you know, the guidelines are considering um, after a certain time of treatment, if there are still presence of uh, symptoms, it can't be the presence uh, still of the pathogen. So, and then they refer um, to a situation uh, um, which is called post uh, a treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So they are only focused on symptoms, but not anymore on the pathogens. And um, based on my uh, long-term experience, this is something uh, we have to take in consideration and uh, we have to go for the right uh, diagnostic even to find out um, if patients are still um, not anymore presenting any activity um, uh, based on Borrelia or its co-infection. Uh, if you will find evidence with the right testing, uh, then it's definitely appropriate uh, to go on uh, longer terms of treatment. And, um, and um, so I will point that out um, uh, a bit uh, more. And uh, it's also important, as I said before, not only to be focused on the causative agent, that means the, pass uh, uh, the, the pathogen. So um, uh, we have to do that in a more holistically uh, way. Um, so um, there, there are a lot of causes um, they, um, uh, which can prevent patient in getting better or getting a good outcome from healing. Um, so the pathogens can um, contribute to a very specific situation um, where um, the host um, is not able to deal in the in the best way uh, with the pathogens. And um, some of these pathogens have the ability to make a lot of uh, uh, travel. So that means they can take over responsibility um, uh, on the immune system. Uh, they can suppress the immune system, uh, telling the immune system that uh, everything is, uh, is good and uh, there's no support any longer needed. Um, uh, to, um, and this helps the pathogens to survive and um, to establish uh, even better. And uh, so it's so important um, uh, uh, if you want to get a good treatment uh, to build up in parallel a very stable and uh, strong immune system, um, then from a certain point on, the immune system should overtake the responsible again. Um, so um, you can't take antibiotics or uh, any forms of antimicrobial uh, for the rest of your life if you are chronic ill. So um, there has to be a point uh, where we um, have to reach out to a situation where we hopefully have killed uh, most or ideally all of the pathogens. Uh, we have uh, downscaled the inflammation and we have built up a strong immune system, which then is able from this point on to take over the role of control. So um, how can uh, Lyme and uh, co-infection uh, persist? So there, there are a lot of uh, options to take control um, over the immune system, what I mentioned before, and um, so that the pathogen uh, can work for longer in the host and uh, making so much trouble. So, um, you know, Lyme disease and its co-infection, they can release chemicals that work synergistically uh, with the chemokines released into the host body from the tick saliva uh, at the time of the inf uh, uh, initial infection. Um, and um, there, there are other options uh, to uh, manipulate um, the biochemistry in the body, so to make um, the the, um, uh, the, um, the the environment more hostile 
um, for these patients to uh, to survive. And it's a very complicated situation, meanwhile. And um, so uh, the specialists should be aware of all these uh, complex issues. Um, uh, and that should be taken in consideration uh, when it uh, comes to the fixing of uh, the treatment later on. Um, so, Uh, here can you see uh, the importance of what we call the um, uh, the survival uh, strategies, specifically of Borrelia. So Borrelia has learned over um, millions of years uh, how to escape um, uh, the, the host immune system. And one of their options is uh, what we call uh, pleomorphism. Pleomorphism means that the pathogens could be present in uh, certain different uh, shapes and forms at the same time. So when Borrelia, uh, after the tick attachment, is entering the human organism, it is, uh, it is based on the spirochetal form, so these snake-like bacteria. But after um, a short time, uh, they will start to change uh, their surface. So you see here on the other pictures, some uh, blood forms or intermediate forms. So this is to protect themselves for any attacks of the host immune system. And finally, um, um, uh, after a while, uh, many of these uh, spirochetal forms will end up in round body forms. So uh, this is what we found in the bloodstream most often um, in chronic stages. So uh, it is suggested that 70 to 80 percent of the uh, of the former spirochetes, uh, when they are in the bloodstream, are more present in round body forms. And another uh, problem is based on the biofilm formation, uh, which I point out in a second. So uh, pleomorphism is the first survival strategy, followed by intracellularity. So that means um, any um, uh, any forms of these tick-borne diseases, Borrelia and its co-infection, uh, can easily um, uh, be transferred uh, into the intracellular space of um, many, many other body cells. Um, Bartonella and um, Babesia is uh, uh, are focused more on uh, or only on the red blood cells, while Borrelia could be found in any other body cells. And last but not least, and that uh, was discovered more recently from the uh, research of the Johns Hopkins University, this is um, the most challenging part of Lyme disease, the so-called persister forms or stationary forms. Um, uh, these are specific microcolonies in connective tissue embedded in biofilm formation. Uh, these are the hardest one to approach and to treat finally. So, but uh, there are definitely uh, some uh, some other um, um, pathogens which uh, could make also the body hospital um, for um, uh, for for Borrelia. So that means. Uh, we see in uh, in the over majority of patients um, uh, a big increase of viral load um, stress. Um, uh, so a patient uh, will have uh, impaired elimination and detox capacities. Um, so um, there's mitochondrial dysfunction seen. Dysbiosis of the gut can also contribute um, uh, to persistence of these infectious diseases and many, many other health conditions, uh, which we most often see at the same time. So um, that um, this is an, um, uh, a slide which is uh, originally presented first time from Rich Horowitz. So when he pointed out um, so uh, dealing with these infectious diseases, um, it's, um, it's a matter of the three big I. So the infection, the inflammation or oxidative stress, and the immunosuppression. And this is what it always is. And we can't ignore uh, one of them uh, in our treatment strategies. We have to fulfill all the requirements to take accurately um, a best um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 for um, all the different three eyes. And what does this mean for me? Um, this is my uh, personal approach, uh, which I have developed over the past uh, 20 or 25 years. And you know, uh, treatment, meanwhile, um, is like building a stable house, um, for example. So you need always a very strong 
um, uh, uh, basement. So the basement is finally based on the anamnesis. So getting all the information about the former history or current history of patient. Uh, and the basement uh, is also relying on a further examination and inspections um, of the patient to see what is ongoing. Uh, finally, um, uh, uh, it's uh, based on any forms of diagnostics. So that includes the lab tests, um, which are required uh, to get to, uh, to the diagnosis, but also other examination um, has to be sometimes included like MRI scans or um, any form of X-ray or uh, specific uh, examination. Um, uh, to get a better overview where we are regarding the infectious diseases or the accompanying health condition. And, uh, you know, um, a house uh, needs um, uh, uh, very solid uh, walls. And uh, this is uh, what you can see here. Uh, this is my model of um, uh, based on eight columns, uh, which can finally be, um, carry the roof. And uh, one of the most important parts of these columns is the uh, antibiotic or antimicrobial treatment, either conventionally based on antibiotics or on alternative herbal antimicrobials or other antimicrobial treatment. Um, uh, there's also, um, um, sorry. Um, there's also um, um, uh, the need for contribute uh, uh, in contributing some other treatments. So uh, patient um, should show up with their commitment uh, to be ready and prepared for some lifestyle and diet changes. So um, it's definitely uh, very beneficial if patients are acknowledging that they can uh, contribute uh, with, a, um, uh, with a healthy diet. So let's say an um, uh, anti-inflammatory diet like the Mediterranean diet, um, uh, if they avoid any forms of processed food, this is contributing uh, to get a much faster, good outcome. Um, very important is the anti-inflammatory support um, the uh, replenishment of nutritions and uh, if needed, if there are any signs in the diagnostic of uh, detox problems, uh, we have also to include some detox. This is most often um, a matter um, um, of strategy, uh, what comes first, the detox or the antimicrobial treatment. Um, this is um, a decision which has to be made uh, more individually. Um, so some patients have pre-existing um, health condition which are requiring other supporting uh, medication. Uh, this is part of the treatment. Um, uh, pain management is of importance as we know that 80 to 90 percent of our patients in chronic conditions um, are suffering from very serious forms of uh, uh, chronic pain syndromes and the worst um, ones are the neuropathic pain syndromes. Um, we can include some exercising and uh, physiotherapy um, um, uh, to, um, uh, to support patients in achieving uh, their goals. Stress management is, um, is uh, always needed. And uh, finally, um, patients also need some mental and social support. Um, so um, uh, uh, as we can see, um, even some of the patients are not um, accepted in their own families. So, you know, um, uh, uh, dealing with chronic conditions like chronic Lyme or uh, its co-infection, uh, patients are uh, in the first uh, uh, view are not looking very serious ill, but um, uh, they are. And this is sometimes, um, um, uh, and there's sometimes a need to explain that uh, to uh, their own families and dealing with uh, other um, uh, boards, for example, with insurance companies, patients need um, a lot of uh, mental and social support. And if we do that all right, um, we have definitely chances uh, for good uh, treatment um, uh, success and uh, in the ideal case of uh, full recovery. So, um, but um, treatment means also meanwhile um, uh, to think about the biofilm formation. So this is something um, um, uh, physician has known for a long time, but um, that it 
could become a major problem in dealing with tick-borne diseases. Uh, that was not quite clear uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. But meanwhile, it's essential to take care right from the beginning for the biofilm formation. And I mentioned in one of the uh, previous slides that uh, the persister forms are always embedded in these slimy um, environments, which we call uh, the biofilms or biofilm formation. And uh, so any good treatment so definitely uh, includes some biofilm busters uh, or biofilm killers. So one of the very common ones could be uh, the NUC, the N-acetylcysteine, which is um, uh, uh, very reasonable uh, price-wise and is doing a great job and has some other advantages um, uh, at the same time. It's a good detoxifier for any uh, liver issues at the same time, and it's definitely still one of my favorites. But there are other alternative um, options like enzymes, uh, like the serapeptase and others, uh, which we can um, uh, include in our treatment regimens. And uh, there are also a lot of um, herbal extracts, uh, which are doing uh, the same good job. So uh, some of the herbals like, um, uh, or, uh, like stevia um, or um, uh, uh, the biocidin or uh, the Makewell products or uh, oregano oil um, are doing really a great job um, as the biofilm killers. And um, there should be no treatment any longer without any uh, biofilm killing at the same time. So um, let's talk a bit um, generally um, about conventional approaches. So um, um, I have said that um, uh, treating uh, Borrelia uh, definitely requires a very um, advanced and comprehensive approach. Um, uh, um, if we take in uh, consideration um, that um, some of the, uh, sorry, um, uh, that uh, some of the pathogens um, um, are, um, um, uh, like the uh, origin spirochetes, and they, th these are the easiest one to treat. So uh, any of the normal antibiotics like beta-lactane, like cephalosporins are doing a great job, um, also other uh, antibiotic uh, classes. Um, but um, uh, we have discussed that there is a problem with the so-called round body forms, um, uh, which had been uh, also called in the past the cystic forms. Uh, we need um, uh, also something um, which supports us in having a good reach out. That could be based on the so-called antimalarias like artemisin or hydroxychloroquine or artovacrone. Uh, but also uh, the nitromidazoles um, are very supportive in uh, approaching and killing the round body forms. Um, and um, all of the tick-borne diseases could be found intracellular, and this requires a, a different other antibiotic classes, for example, like the macrolid, the quinolones, um, uh, and others like uh, the antimicrobacterial um, uh, drugs like rifampicin, rifabutin, and uh, the tetracyclines. And nowadays, uh, we have some alternatives like the dapsone or the methylene blue, for example, and the sulfonamides. Um, um, and for the persister form specifically, uh, we have to start always minimum in a double course of antibiotic, for example, to combine macrolids and um, the uh, sulfamethoxazole, trimetoprim. Uh, it's one of these options to start with or to extend right from the beginning of triple drug courses, according Johns Hopkins University, to include also the tetracycline right from the beginning. So there are multiple options uh, to come to good uh, treatment protocols. And, um, uh, and it's also uh, important to take in consideration some alternatives. You know, the disulfiram or the methylene blue are not seen as antibiotics, but right from the beginning when uh, they have been uh, uh, discovered and developed, it was quite obvious um, that um, um, uh, either the disulfiram or the methylene blue had right from the beginning uh, very good and very strong antibacterial and antiparasitic effects. And um, this is, um, there's a, a revival or renaissance of um, these old 
old fashioned drugs and uh, specifically uh, the methylene blue um, is becoming more and more a game changer and could be part of these um, specific antibiotic um, uh, schemes. Um, so the methylene blue um, and also the disulfiram can replace uh, some of the antibiotic uh, which are recommended uh, to take care uh, best for the uh, tick-borne diseases. Um, um, there's always uh, a different approach available uh, for the treatment. So uh, at the moment, we have only spoken about the conventional approaches based on antibiotic. Um, a second route is uh, what we nowadays call uh, the mixed protocols. We can take advantage of some of the antibiotics, the conventional one, and we can combine that uh, with herbal antimicrobials. And what does it mean? You will see on this slide. So um, there, there are a lot of antimicrobial substances um, uh, um, which had been found, meanwhile, in uh, new studies um, equivalent uh, to some of the antibiotics. So if you do that right, if you go for the right combination of herbal extracts, uh, you can achieve uh, the same or similar good outcome uh, compared to antibiotics. And as I said, um, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can run three different routes the conventional one, the mixed uh, 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 approaches, and the complete alternative approaches. If you do that in the right way, um, uh, and this was my personal approach since a long time. So um, uh, when I started to be focused more and more on alternative protocols for patients who couldn't tolerate any forms of antibiotic uh, due to uh, other health condition or being so sensitive or um, with a very sensitive gut, um, and, uh, uh, I was looking for alternatives. And at the beginning, I used a lot of uh, the American protocols, um, uh, when I uh, noticed that at the time, so long about 20 years ago, uh, none of these American protocols had been listed. And so I decided for myself to develop my own stuff. And um, this is an antimicrobial um, uh, compound based on Artemisia, Monolaurin, Andrographis, Polyporos, Cryptolatus, and garlic extract, uh, so the allicine. Um, which is really taking care for all the tick-borne diseases. And that worked uh, for a long time uh, very well. And in parallel, you should also be focused on the inflammation uh, caused by the presence of these bacteria, uh, parasites, or uh, viruses. And uh, we have also uh, certain uh, options um, uh, to uh, lower the amount of inflammation in the body, um, as you can see, bromelain, grape, uh, grape seed extract, the OPC is recommendable, resveratrol, but also turmeric and black pepper extract. Um, if needed, um, a patient should definitely have some detox uh, treatment. Um, it's a strategic uh, decision. Um, um, uh, you have to make a decision what comes first, detox or directly a start of anti, um, uh, um, uh, antibacterial infection. If you do that at the same time, then you have to be careful not to overload with uh, the detox um, uh, compounds because uh, the detox, uh, some of the detox compounds can neutralize uh, the effic uh, efficacy of uh, the antimicrobial um, uh, herbals um, at the same time. And it's also important uh, to stabilize and to strain uh, the immune system. So multivitamin supplementation, beta glucans, and uh, immunomodulatory um, herbal extract that could be um, uh, recommendable. Um, so um, after a while, I noticed that uh, in some areas with really hot spots of Bartonella infection or um, uh, Babesia infection, um, the, um, um, the former mentioned um, uh, um, uh, a drug compound based on these six herbs uh, had been not sufficient uh, enough. And uh, there was a need uh, to extend uh, for patients with serious Bartonella problems or serious Babesia and, uh, to extend uh, these protocols. And uh, there are certain options to do so. Uh, when we have a major problem with Bartonella, we can add to the uh, uh, to the uh, basic treatment, some Guteng, a Chinese herb, Lapacho, and Cystus incanus, for example, for parasitic infection. Um, the black walnut uh, extract uh, is doing a great job, um, or, um, uh, uh, or uh, others, as you can see. 
Um, and, uh, you know, some of the opportunistic co-infection, like chlamydian uh, mycoplasma, which never been transmitted via tick bite. So um, the mechanism is different. So Borrelia when, uh, or other tea, um, uh, uh, tick-borne diseases, when they entering the organism um, and uh, starting uh, with suppression of the immune system, um, that will lead to some openness of the upper respiratory tract. And this is the reason why you see in parallel, most of the time, airborne transmitted infection like uh, chlamydia and mycoplasma pneumonia, and also all the viral infection, EBV, uh, cytomegalovirus, uh, coxsackie, and so on. And um, this um, uh, um, requires also some specific attention and uh, for the opportunistic bacterial infection, uh, my recommendation would be, uh, be uh, to go on some nastitinin and horse radish, for example. And uh, for the viral infection, um, an extract of scutellaria and monolaurin and some others uh, could be very beneficial and, um, and helpful uh, for patients. Um, so additionally to these um, uh, 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 antimicrobial approaches, we should definitely take in consideration, as I mentioned before in one of these slides, uh, dietary changes and adjustments. So uh, we have to look for some anti-inflammatory um, support. We have to look for lifestyle changes and um, uh, a lot of other uh, additionally um, and individual support. Um, regarding supplementation, medication, uh, like uh, and the mental coaching and so on, I have mentioned um, before. And, you know, um, this is what we are still aiming with all our effort um, is really um, to, first of all, to eliminate um, or, um, or better, if possible, to eradicate um, as best as possible the pathogens. So that means the viruses, the bacteria, and the parasites. Um, we have also to regulate uh, the body's immune response and to give certain support for this. We have to reduce uh, the local and general uh, inflammation. And last but not least, to get really to a good outcome, we should also uh, promote uh, the repair of damaged tissue. Um, until a certain point, this is possible. But uh, if we are over that point, um, then uh, you can expect permanent damages. And there's no more repair possible. Um, but um, this is very late uh, in chronic stages. So it's definitely wise to think about uh, these um, induction of these repairing processes. And I would definitely say it's, it's, it's worth to do so. And, uh, you know, and this is my personal um, uh, definition of healing, and probably there will be a question in that direction um, in a couple of minutes. So, you know, we are trying to eradicate as best as possible um, the causative uh, agents, uh, so mean the bacteria, the viruses, um, but there is no test system available uh, which can give us 100% evidence of full eradication. So, uh, what um, uh, healing could mean um, uh, in uh, 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 in this respect. So that means um, that um, uh, we, uh, so healing means that patients are more or less or completely free of any symptoms. Um, so um, we have achieved a very good restoration of immunity and uh, we have been able to balance um, so the system enabling um, uh, 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 dysfunction and if we achieve all that together, uh, patients are uh, really in a much better shape, or let's say in a good shape. And uh, this is what we um, uh, what we mean with um, uh, with healing. Um, and you know, but um, a patient has, on the other hand, uh, to take in consideration there are multiple um, uh, causes which can lead later on to reactivation. Um, but um, generally, um, after good um, uh, treatment, 70% of the patient are more or less symptom-free and in good shape and condition. Yeah, so um, this is uh, what I want to tell you today. And um, um, uh, thank you for your attention and listening to my presentation. And now it's the right time uh, to ask your question. And I'm, I'm hoping that there are loads of them. Oui, bien. On avait coupé le, le micro un peu à tout le monde, donc, y, y compris à moi. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karsten. It's been a, an impressive uh, presentation. Merci, merci. Uh, franchement, c'était un, une super présentation. Je sais que la traduction, les sous-titres, ce n'était pas forcément évident. Je ne sais pas si vous avez réussi un peu à déplacer éventuellement les sous-titres pour mieux voir les slides en dessous. De toute façon, ce sera en replay. Ce sera disponible en, en replay. Pas très longtemps, parce qu'on ne va pas les garder très, très longtemps euh, euh, disponible, mais dans les mois qui viennent, on va dire qu'on va l'avoir disponible. Et il y aura normalement les sous-titres avec. Voilà. Euh, J'ai noté pas mal de questions. So I have a, a couple of questions for you, Karsten. I'm afraid we have hundreds of questions, not hundreds, but we have so much, so many. And uh, you know, uh, as as we rehearsed a little bit earlier, uh, I said to Karsten, you know, um, if we want to go to browse all the questions. You have to be very, very short in terms of answers. I know it's very frustrating for you because it's a complex uh, illness and a complex uh, issue. So, la première question que que qu'on avait avant la la réunion et je prendrai après des questions de la réunion. Hein. Qu'est-ce que le docteur Karsten uh, Nikolaos pense du du traitement um, du docteur Horowitz pour ceux qui l'ont vu l'année dernière, il avait fait une une vidéo avec nous à peu près à la même époque avec euh, beaucoup de Dapson, de d'autres antibiotiques et du bleu de méthylène. So, what what's your thought about uh, Dr. Horowitz's uh, DDD, you know, double dose Dapson uh, yeah. treatment combined treatment with methylene blue and so on? Yeah, um, so um, uh, um, it could be um, the relief for some patient who didn't respond at all other treatment uh, protocols, but it's definitely not a first line treatment. Uh, the reason why I'm saying it's not first line recommendation is quite easy. Um, so um, uh, the high dose um, uh, pulse dapsone treatment um, is uh, a very risky treatment in some way. Um, so going on these high dosages, that requires a certain support protocol to avoid um, uh, certain risk factors, uh, which automatically will come up on this treatment. And uh, that requires a constantly monitoring. So, and this is where I'm a bit afraid, um, based on my long-term experience dealing with French patients, um, uh, this is a matter of commitment of local doctors. So if you start uh, these types of treatment, so for, for some, it's, uh, it's the best outcome, but that requires a constantly monitoring and 100% commitment of the local doctor. And um, uh, uh, what, what I mean with this is, um, in the first one or two weeks minimum, um, so it might be that you have uh, twice a week blood tests, yeah, to see about the risk factor. So made hemoglobin um, other uh, a change of the blood count. So dapsone sometimes can cause um, within hours a drop down of the numbers of the red blood cells um, and a serious condition which are similar to carbon monoxide in, um, uh, intoxication, for example. And um, so in the worst case scenario, that requires blood transfusion. I'm not saying it's a bad um, uh, a treatment. So it's for some uh, the last chance of getting really good outcome. But again, that requires an optimal uh, situation at your local place, commitment of a doctor, access to, um, uh, uh, to really a, a lot of lab tests. And if that is guaranteed, um, um, uh, go for that. Okay, thank you for the, this, this interesting uh, feedback. Just Just for your... Uh, knowledge. We have one of our members who, who've been doing this treatment. She's a very, very courageous woman, very you know, determined. But she said that was a hell. That was a hell. At the end of it, she was uh, really glad because it's. she says, you know, I've never been living like uh, as well as today. Donc, en gros, il faut être sous surveillance. C'est ce qu'il qu faut retenir. Et en particulier, l'anémie est, est quand même avec la Dapson. Uh, un vrai sujet. Voilà. Do you have uh, next questions? Uh, do you have any news from the ongoing clinic trial on high in A? Donc, est-ce que vous avez un, un, une idée ou un retour du traitement clinique qui est en cours avec l'hygromycine A du docteur Kim Lewis? Hygromycine A, c'est c'est un traitement assez prometteur. So, what's your thought on that? Well, uh, hydromycin A is definitely a very promising substance. So, so when hydromycin A, I just re repeat it because I see that the translator is not very good. 
Also, Hygromycin A, Hygromycin A, okay. Yeah, Hygromycin A is very promising in that way um, that um, the, uh, the preliminary uh, studies which had been published by Dr. Lewis um, are promising in that way um, that uh, uh, Hygromycin or Mycin A is definitely approaching um, the, uh, the tick-borne diseases best without um, uh, uh, causing any trouble in the gut, microbiome gut. So it looks to be a very selective antibiotic, specifically focused on tick-borne diseases without causing any serious side effects in the gut. And uh, there seems to be no other antibiotic which was able to do so. So at the moment, um, uh, so uh, uh, there uh, have started with preparation with the first clinical trials and the phase one studies uh, will be started first in Australia and then followed by the US. At the moment, they are um, in the process of requiring patient to be part of that uh, project. But um, so realistically, um, uh, we have uh, three of these um, uh, test phases and that will definitely take minimum uh, three to five years uh, to get access to the results before we can expect introduction if it comes uh, if everything is going right uh, to get that uh, routinely into treatment so it will take years so we have to survive in the meantime before uh, ju just a, few, a little uh, note from lisa banier who's who's writing right now she's uh, attending and she's saying hello dr nicolaus you treated me uh, 12 years ago it was not easy but i was 12, and But 12 years later, I can say you cured me. Thank you very much. So you have one, you have a, a fan <laughs> among us. Yeah. Ho hopefully it was not only one patient I have. Um, okay, okay, bien sûr. I Donc le docteur Nicolaos, c'est Lisa Bagnier qui écrit en disant qu'elle a été soignée avec, euh, avec beaucoup de... Bref, qu'elle qu l'a guérie. Euh, une nouvelle question, ozonothérapie. What do you think about that? No, ozone uh, therapy is meanwhile best established. Ozone therapy, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ozone uh, treatment is best established meanwhile, uh, but not as a um, uh, standalone treatment. So uh, it's definitely seen as an add-on to antimicrobial treatment. Um, and then you can definitely speed it up and you can definitely get a much better response um, on uh, on the uh, on the complete uh, treatment but a series of uh, let's say eight to ten uh, ozone treatments so i prefer the iv ozone treatment uh, one or two sessions per week uh, is definitely best, uh, beneficial for patients great um same question for hyperthermia yeah, that, 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 that's, Okay, that's a bit um, uh, uh, more complex um, uh, question. You know, a um, couple of years ago when um, uh, hyperthermia um, was introduced into treatment of um, uh, Lyme disease, uh, it um, uh, sounded very promising. And uh, just, just, Karsten, it's, you know, it's translated hypothermia, it's hyperthermia. Huh? Okay, it's like 42 degrees more or less. So yeah, and, and, you know, we are talking about um, the uh, the very high uh, temperature, minimum 40, uh, 1.5 to 42 degrees. Yeah, this is the right uh, hyperthermia. And if you do that right, um, uh, it looked very promising uh, some, uh, in the first couple of years, uh, but there had been always obstacles uh, when patients showed up with a so-called co-infection. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, when I uh, traveled first time to the U.S., uh, so uh, there had been many clinics offering hyperthermia uh, at that time, but um, it looks like not any more longer. So uh, there are less and less clinics uh, believing in the best outcome of hyperthermia, uh, specifically uh, because of the risk um, if uh, co-infection um, are seen at the same time. So um, uh, these high range uh, 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 treatment with heat and 42 degrees in patient, for example, with Babesia infection could be life threatening and you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, and you know, uh, and most of the places I have seen, meanwhile, are offering the low um, uh, temperature uh, just to enhance the immune capacity. Uh, but there are not much places are offering really um, uh, uh, the high fever range uh, treatment. So uh, again, there are definitely some patients who got a lot of benefits out of the treatment. But interestingly, um, uh, I have seen uh, many of them later on showing up with co-infection. And uh, this was not part of the treatment. So I would be a bit uh, hesitant regarding hyperthermia at the moment. Okay. 
pour French or, or Belgian patients, donc pour les patients français ou, ou belges, qui who, who can't afford overseas or, or abroad consultations, what would be your advice, Dr. Nicolas? So, quel, quel serait votre, votre conseil pour les gens qui, qui n'ont pas les moyens d'aller se faire traiter à l'étranger, qu'ils soient français ou belges? J'ai vu que un ami belge parmi nous pose la question également. Est-ce que vous avez, do you have a list of, of doctors you've trained, for example, in Belgium or? Or friends. Oh, but, uh, so we can definitely share a list of doctors um, who are offering services. So you know, for the for the French patient who are really in that um, uh, bad situation, getting no real uh, support, and you know, for the ones who have uh, some good um, uh, a contact or relationship with a local doctor. Um, so we can definitely take in consideration one of these mixed protocols uh, to take some antibiotics on top of herbal uh, antimicrobial compounds. Uh, this is definitely something um, uh, which uh, uh, can be um, organized and supported in the local area. For all the ones uh, who can't rely on good support of their local doctors, uh, the only chance if they won't uh, 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 want to go abroad, um, uh, um, you can rely only on good um, herbal antimicrobial protocols, and some of them are meanwhile scientifically approved. So there had been um, a minimum three, meanwhile four publication more recently from Johns Hopkins and from the uh, Lyme uh, Bay Lyme uh, Group in uh, California. Uh, where you can get um, uh, a list of um, uh, of herbs which should be part of the treatment and uh, all of these herbal extracts are uh, more or less free available and uh, the risk is uh, really on a low level if you do that right you can definitely uh, start that by your own at home um, and from time to time and the, the monitoring for these herbal approaches is completely different so you need only from time to time some testing Um, uh, even to find out where uh, you exactly are and uh, uh, to determine the time uh, to skip the treatment later on. We have a lot of questions. Et juste pour dire, on essaiera de répondre à toutes les questions, même auxquelles on ne pourra pas répondre à l'oral, uh, par, par, um, par écrit. Hein. So if, if you agree, doctor, doctor, maybe some of these questions we will be able to answer later, uh, uh, further by your just written messages if you if you oh, that's 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 thank you so much uh sur deux, trois questions qui, en ai beaucoup, hein. you know we we talk a lot about phages for tests like the pcr phages uh, in belgium the red labs and also phagotherapy donc on parle des phages de la des tests à partir des bactériophages notamment la société red labs en, en belgique fait des tests sur, euh, sur Lyme à partir de ces techniques qui semblent assez prometteuses également et il y a peut-être même des, des options de, de thérapie à partir de ces bactériophages. So, you know, phage treatment uh, is definitely um, uh, a bit more old-fashioned. It's not something quite new. Um, when I, uh, uh, so when I uh, uh, set up a second clinic in 2007-2008 in the north of Germany, I was always in contact with some colleagues uh, from the balcony from Yugoslavia, um, because um, uh, there are really some good specialists in Russia, uh, specifically in the Eastern European countries, with a lot of uh, experience with phage treatment. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, so far, we can't rely on really good studies at the moment. It's more or less um, uh, uh, still in an experimental stage. So um, if patients have uh, the chance to be part of some of these uh, studies, I guess um, uh, um, I personally believe um, that is something you can give a go. Um, but um, uh, we can't rely really on sustainable data, um, uh, long exper uh, long term experience and um, uh, good studies um, uh, to uh, provide the information. It, it, should, it will be a, a standard or routine uh, treatment. Um, so uh, the future will show uh, how it works. Okay. A pregnant woman, in what would, you, would be your advice for a pregnant woman? Donc, pour une femme enceinte, qu'est-ce que vous recommanderiez? 
Okay, um, uh, this is a, uh, this is also a very important question. So you know we have to differentiate between acute stages and chronic stages of Lyme or its co-infection. So if um, uh, if a pregnant woman uh, will notice after a tick bite that she is getting an erythema migrans, or if there's evidence of uh, tick-borne diseases. Uh, this woman has to be treated immediately. And there are antibiotic trials available, best approved and, um, uh, uh, based on science to start with. Um, in acute stages, the relatively short treatment without any risk for the fetus or the mom it, uh, 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 herself. So uh, it's a, a risk-free treatment. Um, it's a similar situation. And, you know, the risk um, in acute stages of transmission of the pathogens via the placenta to the fetus is up to 80%. So it's quite high the risk. So it is required to treat these pregnant women. Uh, the situation in chronic stages of Lyme is quite uh, similar. There's not this high risk of 80% uh, percent transmission, but the transmission rate is around about 30 to 40%. So uh, that means we can't ignore um, uh, chronic stages of Lyme in pregnancy. Um, and uh, we are uh, we have good treatment for for the pregnant women without any risk for the baby and also not for the mom. But the focus um, in treatment and chronic stages is to inhibit the transmission via the placenta to the fetus. So we try everything um, uh, to to take care for the baby. And uh, these treatment protocols are not the optimal ones for treating the mom. Yeah, you can give some support, but we are far away from these extended individualized treatment protocols because of potential side effects of antibiotic. But some of the antibiotics could be given without any risk. And um, this is um, something we have to take in consideration. We can't ignore Lyme disease or its co-infection pregnancy because otherwise untreated in acute or chronic stages, uh, it will um, uh, have the risk of big harmings for both. Yeah, it may be more or less the same, uh, same question for what do you think about uh, sexual uh, transmissions or, or even saliva, donc les transmissions uh, sexuelles ou par la salive? Yeah. They, are not, they have not been demonstrated so far, not proved, but some yeah. exist. Yeah. No, we, we can definitely, um, uh, we can't rely really on uh, very serious data. Um, so the first study which was published was uh, by Stringer uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when he uh, published um, case reports of four couples out of his practice, um, mentioning that there might be a risk of sexual transmission. Otherwise, we can rely only on some case reports. Um, there was um, a Borrelia found in uh, in a male semen, and we have uh, two case reports where in uh, vaginal lesions of women, they have found Borrelia. Uh, but otherwise, we are lacking. So the BCA clinic, my former clinic, and uh, together with other uh, um, uh, clinics here in, in Europe, um, after Stricker has published his paper about these four couples, uh, we have investigated around about uh, 100 uh, couples, uh, and we looked in all possible um, uh, lab diagnostics. So we looked into the male semen, we did uh, vaginal swaps, uh, we went on PCR in blood, we went on, um, uh, on the ALI spots, we went on serology, and uh, in all these couples, we haven't found any evidence of sexual transmission. That also means nothing. Uh, 100 cases uh, are more than four. Um, so, you know, uh, there is there is probably a minor problem, but it's definitely not a big problem at the moment. So otherwise, um, the, um, uh, the, the data uh, would show up different. Okay. Just maybe a quick for you. I know you, you know that by heart. Is low CD57 um, index a sufficient um, indicator to determine if a person has Lyme disease? Donc, est-ce que les un niveau bas de CD57, ce sont les natural killer CD57, est-ce que ça, c'est un indicateur pour déterminer qu'on a Lyme? So, um, the CD57 is still, uh, let's say, one of the only or best parameters uh, to determine about chronic stages. Uh, for uh, At the beginning, we believe 
that CD57 had been specific for chronic Lyme. This is definitely not anymore true. So uh, new data specifically from California uh, some years ago have pointed out that the CD57 um, are a marker representing uh, chronic stages of um, uh, bacterial and parasitic infection. Um, uh, new studies have also shown some minor impact on viral infection, um, but it's still one of the best um, uh, parameters uh, to determine chronic stages. So any forms of suppression um, uh, uh, on certain levels are indicating definitely a long-term problem because we have learned that um, these uh, subclasses of natural killer cells uh, will, uh, will be not will not be suppressed in acute stages. Uh, it takes a long time to see these uh, suppressions of natural killer cells. So up to one year. And this is why we can take still in consideration we are dealing with um, uh, chronic conditions. And um, uh, finally, based on empirical findings, uh, we have determined the levels, uh, let's say optimal ranges, um, uh, pathological ranges and very deteriorated ranges, um, uh, which uh, are still used. And um, uh, there's a lab uh, in the US offering uh, a different type of immune status. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a so-called immune assessment, um, uh, which seems to be a bit more specific as the CD57 and K cell test here in Europe. Uh, but this test is not available in uh, in Europe. So only, and uh, it's time sensitive uh, and needs a uh, shipment overnight. And this is more or less impossible. We have a question about electrosensitivity. So hypersensitivity to electricity. And uh, is there any specific therapy? So is, can, is there a first uh, a real correlation between Lyme and hypersensitivity, I would say? And second, uh, is there a therapy? So in français, uh, en gros, c'est l'électrosensibilité. Est-ce qu'il y a une, uh, un lien avec Lyme? Et on en trouve quand même beaucoup parmi nos, nos patients. Et puis, uh, et parmi nos membres, pardon. Et puis, y a-t-il une thérapie? So I won't say uh, Lyme is uh, uh, causing the electrosensitivity, but it's part of the problem. So, and coming back to uh, what I call the complexity of these illnesses. So there are many, many health conditions at the same time. And most of the time we see overreaction or overstimulation of our immune system, uh, which will respond with um, uh, 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 with hyper reaction. And uh, the electrosensitivity can be part of that. Um, before, we have definitely a lot of onset of autoimmune diseases in some way, yeah? So uh, so it's it's a mix of many different uh, health conditions at the same time, um, which in some patients could lead to electrosensitivity. In others, um, they will uh, present other health conditions. Um, and so finally, um, uh, we have to look for the causes. Um, we have to see... Uh, what is real found in these patients, and then based on that um, a treatment, including positive treatment of the chronic infection, uh, which are mostly coming first before you see onset of autoimmune diseases. So this is um, a general learning for me, um, which I observed right from the 90s when I stepped into the field. So on average, it will take between three and five years uh, dealing with chronic condition like chronic infection to see the first onset of mild or moderate uh, autoimmune diseases. So this is why we see uh, these type of um, uh, uh, responses quite often in our chronic ill patients. Great. <clears throat> again, we have hundreds of questions, but maybe a, a, a couple of them again, if you if you don't mind. How about the Buner protocol? Yeah. The protocol Buner. Yeah, um, uh, uh, so I'm a big fan of Buner. So when I, I became more and more interested in the 90s, I uh, I traveled uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, first time to the US. And um, uh, I was um, excited and uh, lucky uh, to meet all the 
um, the, the big um, uh, guys in the US, uh, including Stephen Buhner, uh, Baron White, uh, and later on uh, Susan McCamish, who came much later. And uh, I'd also meeting with Lee Coden, and I was hoping to learn from these guys. And um, I have to say uh, the discussion with Stephen Buhner had been the best I have ever had uh, regarding um, alternative protocols. And I had uh, multiple uh, meetings with him um, uh, um, uh, in the, uh, 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 until his death a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, um, uh, and we had sometimes very controversial discussion, I have to say, and I can tell you why. Um, probably um, no one is aware that Stephen Buhner never have treated any patients. So, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, he hadn't. Um, uh, so he has done a great job, uh, his research to find out so much about uh, all the herbs and their indication, um, uh, how to use them best in treatment for viral infection or bacterial infection. But you not never have treated any patient. And, you know, and I had some controversial discussion and I can tell you one, uh, because this is of interest. So in America, based on his publication, it is um, it's a set um, that uh, Artemisia should be uh, pulsed only for one or two weeks, then having a break before uh, doing a restart. Yeah, just just pulsed, pulsé en fait, hein? yeah. something like you and do it, you stop, you go, you stop, you go. Exactly. Right? But uh, this is the wrong approach, and I can tell you why. Uh, <laughs> we have been able uh, to go for trough level measurement, so we have measured the concentration in the blood. Yeah, a long time ago, and we have seen uh, this is a very fragile concentration. If you stop treatment within 24 hours, the substance was out of the body, out of the blood. Yeah. So if you want to get a sustainable outcome, specifically use Artemisia annua, you have to stay on track, constantly treat him. And this was one of the discussion I had with him. So he was um, convinced that pulsing is the best way. And I uh, told him, I have treated really more than 20,000 patients with Artemisia annua, and I've never seen any bad reaction on that yeah and um, and this is important but otherwise so he he he's my hero in some way yeah 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 but he was not a excuse, doctor right oh, sorry excuse me i have a question so um what do you think about uh code and protocol code and, yeah um, so, um, uh, in my former clinic, um, very early, I have made an officially um, uh, a study for uh, the Cowden protocol. And, you know, at the beginning, um, for my patient, it was very, very promising. Um, but uh, after a couple, of, so in the first three months, so it, it looked like that um, a patient responded very well. But uh, then uh, in extended protocols, um, I have seen more side effects as I have ever seen with antibiotic, and I stopped um, uh, any use of cowden. But this is my personal um, experience. So, I have a question, maybe to not to finish, but, but almost to finish. You know, a, a couple of, <clears throat> well, a lot of members actually, they ask themselves, you know, how am I going to, to become in the next coming years or so? We are in phase three, you know, uh, new, neuroborreliosis. And uh, and uh, so, is there any hope? So, la question, c'est, de, de beaucoup de nos membres, hein, c'est finalement, euh, on arrive à, à, après un, pas mal d'années à une neuroborreliose en, en stade yeah. 3. On a des, effectivement de, de, gros, de, gros, de grosses difficultés. Et, et finalement, euh, is there a hope? Est-ce qu'il y a un espoir? No, def definitely, yes. Um, uh, so I've uh, treated a lot of uh, patients with neuroborreliosis, and this is where my clinic, wa uh, uh, a former clinic was famous for, for patients with these very serious neurological forms of uh, Lyme disease or um, its co-infections. Um, you know, it's a matter of, uh, of the treatment and a matter of the damages. So most of the damages for a long time are not permanent, they are uh, temporarily. So that means if you go for the right approaches, you have to choose for the right antibiotic, the ones which can easily pass the blood brain barrier. Um, so um, if you treat patient in that way, uh, you can definitely uh, start with good positive treatment. And in parallel, it's, it's needed to um, scale down the local inflammation in different parts of the brain 
Yeah, um, this is uh, in in very late stages. These are these white specks you can see in MRI scans, which are similar looking like uh, MS cases, for example. Yeah, but uh, this is really in late, late, late stage uh, cases. So again, if you do that right, anti, uh, um, uh, so um, uh, treating in the right way the infection, lowering um, uh, the inflammation and boosting the immune system, patient even in serious forms have definitely some good chances of recovery. Okay, maybe a, another question. Um, can you give your blood you know, transfusion uh, when you are uh, having the syndrome of Alphagal syndrome. So the le, le syndrome of Alphagal. So Alphagal first, do you, do you have that many number of, a big number of, uh, of patients? Yeah, yeah, no, Alphagal, yeah. yeah. Peut son sang, ça. I, I personally uh, would say um, any patient with chronic stage of tick-borne diseases should never go uh, uh, to spend blood. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 to give blood uh, 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 or uh, uh, being a blood donor. Is, uh, is it so forbidden I, in Germany uh, or in the U.S.? Is it forbidden? In the US, no, uh, this is what I wanted to point out. At the moment, in the U.S., uh, uh, blood is only checked for Babesia infection in certain areas. It's not a general check like for uh, HIV or uh, hepatitis. And, you know, uh, we would wish uh, that uh, more of these tick-borne diseases would be screened before uh, patients uh, are becoming a blood donor um, because we know exactly that uh, there are uh, loads of people in the U.S. who got uh, their uh, Lyme or their infection with tick other tick-borne diseases via blood transfusion. So uh, it would be great if there's a if there would be a general check, um, but um, um, uh, there's nothing on the way at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with uh, the alpha gal. Um, this is a very specific uh, situation, and you know, um, as we really don't know um, how um, uh, how does it work for others, I I would recommend everyone. Um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, tick-borne diseases, not uh, to be a blood donor at the moment. Exactly. This, this is the point. In France, it's the same. They don't forbid it, which is a little crazy because in the in the US, the CDC, they, they made it very clear when you have Lyme, when you are treated for Lyme, you can't, you can't give your blood. I guess uh, that's, uh, that's not a good idea from my uh, point of view and my experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, which antibiotic is more recommended than doxycycline? Oh, most of the others, I have to say. Yeah. And just doxycycline, just to, to, to give a compliment of info or maybe question. Yes. Um, we, we hear that doxycycline can increase the kistic form of Borrelia. Donc, en gros, quel est la meilleur, le meilleur antibiotique? Est-ce qu'il est qu y a mieux que la doxycycline? Et la doxycycline... Elle donnerait la forme donc kystique, la forme ronde en fait de, de Borrelia. I'm, I'm, I'm still wondering why uh, doxycycline is the first line recommendation. You know, yeah. I, I was um, uh, trained at a time where um, uh, infectologists in Germany um, uh, uh, warned to use uh, any forms of doxycycline because of 70% uh, of the German population was resistant against doxycycline. This is one good reason. The other good uh, reason um, for me not to go on doxycycline are the following. Doxycycline is pretty bad um, in uh, transpassing the blood-brain barrier. Only 30 to 35% uh, can pass, so uh, we can't build up really good trap levels um, in uh, any part of the nerve system. There are better antibiotics available. Um, there's a big problem uh, most of the year in the good uh, uh, in the good time, so spring and summer, uh, where we have the problem with sun exposure, um, and uh, that could also lead to serious problems. So, um, in combination, sometimes it's doing a great job, um, but as a standalone. Um, I'm doubting that that is a good approach. And um, uh, I think uh, there are other and better antibiotics available to, um, uh, um, uh, to treat patients with Lyme or other co-infections. Maybe one of the last last ones. Um, how about Elispot? Elispot is a, a test lab, a test um, kit, which uh, works uh, apparently quite pretty much in, in, the, in Germany. Uh, over here, you know, the, the infectiologists, they, they, 
they criticize it and saying that it's too sensitive. So, donc, en fait, par rapport à Elisa, il y a un autre test qui s'appelle Elispot, qui d'ailleurs a été inventé par un Français, bref, en, dans les années 90, et qui est très courant, notamment en, en Allemagne et aux États-Unis, et qui est, qui est beaucoup utilisé pour euh, Borrelia et les co-infections. Et en fait, Elispot est critiqué par les... Et même, il est refusé d'être reconnu par les infectiologistes français, les infectiologues français, parce qu'ils disent qu'il est trop sensible. So, you know, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, that's my um, uh, my start. Um, Elispot technique is the gold standard, meanwhile, for tuberculosis, for Q fever, um, for, even for long haul COVID. Yeah, uh, it's the only test system which can determine exactly if patients are long haulers. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the important information. Otherwise, so right from the 80s, I was involved in research group. Um, um, I did my PhD in transplant immunology and. Um, and the, the former generation of ELI spot, the lymphocyte transformation testing, um, uh, was um, uh, uh, invented or um, uh, uh, for uh, early diagnostic of infectious diseases in transplant medicine. Uh, it was a standard testing uh, in the 80s for viral infection, for some bacterial infection. And much later, uh, it was adapted in Berlin from Professor von Beer for tick-borne diseases. Interestingly, um, um, uh, there's only a, a, a controversial discussion when it comes to Lyme. For the other infectious diseases, no one is taking care about Elie's And I'm I'm still thinking it's a political discussion a, a decision, and um, we we do not have any other test system which is able to monitor patients. And uh, specifically in the pandemic, it came up um, uh, how important uh, the early spot testing is. Uh, meanwhile, and um, uh, and I know about these studies. I guess the study design was not as best. Um, um, and um, I I was the first clinic in Germany um, introducing early spot technique as a routine testing. And I can say in uh, meanwhile more than 25 years using early spots uh, and LTT even longer the former generation, I can, can only speak uh, speak good about this type of testing, but it's not stand alone. So my approach is different. Um, so, uh, and this is what I'm uh, uh, telling the doctors um, uh, in, uh, in training. So you should do um, for different testing at the beginning at the same time to get much better chances of getting the right diagnosis. Later on, if you have a proper diagnosis based on lab tests, based on clinical findings for the monitoring, um, you can forget any forms of uh, serology testing, PCR testing, whatever it is. The only monitoring uh, could be done with ELI spots. Maybe two last questions this time. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you are okay. Uh, no, maybe maybe we have another question. Okay, so maybe my two last ones. <laughs> Sorry, uh, first, thyroid, thyroid, sorry, thyroid. Is it linked to, uh, and also adrenal glands, you know, these glands, are they, we we see that uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, Lyme patients, they have issues with Lyme, uh, with thyroid. En gros, c'est le lien entre les, les, les glandes de la thyroïde et les glandes adrénaline, uh, adrénal, non? Adrénal, on dit en français? Subrénal? So, no, adrenal. So at first, um, um, 30, minimum 30 to 40 percent of, uh, of all Lyme patients have a problem with thyroiditis, Hashimoto. So this is an autoimmune disease which is following the chronic infection. Yeah. And we see that also for other pathogens, uh, for other co infection um, uh, quite often. Um, and, um, you know, um, uh, and there's evidence that specifically Borrelia and in some way also Bartonella could have impact in any of the other hormonal pathways. It can affect um, um, uh, the adrenal system, it can affect uh, the cholesterol, it can affect um, the, the glucose levels and the sexual hormone uh, and so on. And this is something uh, we see quite often in our patients. So it's definitely good um, at the beginning to get an overview where patients are regarding any hormonal dysfunction, because this is something you have to balance uh, while being treated to get a better outcome. 
Okay, thank you. It explains a lot of things. And uh, my my last question. Sorry to to finish by this one. No, no. no. Go this ahead. is uh, one. yeah, yeah, yours. Okay, Nathalie. Donc, uh, quid de la transplantation fécale pour traiter Lyme? What about how about a fecal transplantation to treat Lyme? Okay. Oh, that is also wonderful. Did you try it? Yeah, no, I, uh, you know, um, very often uh, chronic conditions or chronic infection uh, will cause a dysbiosis of the gut. And um, not all of them, uh, depending on, on other health condition, you can balance with the intake of uh, pre and probiotics or some um, uh, anti-inflammatory stuff um, uh, to scale down the inflammation in the uh, in the uh, in the gut tissues. So um, for these patients, um, uh, it could make really sense uh, to think about fecal transplantation, but not uh, for everyone. Nathalie, merci. Euh, du coup, je vais la poser en français pour que tout le monde puisse euh, me comprendre et tu vas la traduire. Euh, lorsque je fais les visio Lyme, j'ai régulièrement euh, la question de savoir euh, bah, finalement combien de temps est-ce qu'il faut être traité euh, ou par des, des personnes qui, qui débarquent dans le sujet, mais aussi euh, des gens qui ont une expérience avec euh, la maladie chronique, qui ont déjà fait plusieurs protocoles. Et même quand ils sont dans des protocoles qui fonctionnent, finalement, même un protocole qui fonctionne, combien de temps il faut le faire So, I think the question speaks for itself. But for a chronic patient, like long chronic patient, you meet a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, how, do, how long does it take to, to get back on track and, and to be yeah. healed yeah. to a certain extent? You know, um, uh, this is uh, sometimes very challenging and uh, it's not uh, working with all patients best right from the beginning. Sometimes um, it, it's a bit try and error in some way. But, you know, uh, most often um, I have acknowledged in patients who had been really on long term treatment before uh, I have seen them first. They got um, uh, most often uh, antibiotics and sometimes the right on antibiotics, but not in the combination which is required according latest science yeah many of the patient got the whole bunch of antibiotics but never in the right combination and this is the secret of treatment yeah again coming back to my slides you have to take in consideration you are dealing with the original spirochetes you are dealing with round body forms you're dealing with intracellular ones and persistent forms and you need the right combination. And at the moment, we can rely only more or less on three to four triple drug treatment courses according latest science from Johns Hopkins and, um, uh, and uh, Tulane University um, uh, uh, to make it right. And many of the previous used antibiotic protocols had never been sufficient enough They were lacking of uh, efficacy of the persister forms. So patient never had the chance of recover completely. Thanks a lot. Okay. So we have to be patient. Yep. Yeah, we uh, know that. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, this was the first I had to learn in dealing with Lyme patients. So I was very enthusiastic um, uh, when I uh, saw my first Lyme patient. And uh, let's say based on the guidelines, so uh, job is done within two or three days. Um, but the reality was completely different. Yeah, And I had to learn to be patient. My patient had to be uh, learned to be patient. And it took me a while to get better and better understanding. And meanwhile, Um, uh, I have to say, sometimes it takes really a, a long time um, because there are so many um, uh, uh, parts of a puzzle you have to put together and to get the right understanding. Yeah? And sometimes it, it needs that time to get a good outcome. Uh, and you know, I'm definitely uh, also not the one who is um, able to determine exactly right from the beginning the, the right approach because the response of patients is very individual. Yeah, and maybe, uh, maybe I have a last last question if you if you don't mind. No, no. about oxygen hyperbar. You know, uh, does it can it repair the neurons? You know, the, the brain. So l'oxygen hyperbar à 1,3 bar. On voit des questions d'oxygène euh, avec euh, plus d'oxygène. No, Est-ce que ça peut réparer le cerveau? Yes. Yeah. Hyperbaric uh, oxygen treatment uh, is not a standalone treatment. In combination with antimicrobial treatment is doing a great job. Why? 
because of the high pressure and the oxygenation, you have a much better blood flow, uh, bl uh, blood flow in any part of the nerve system. So that means um, uh, uh, the transport of uh, the medication is much better. You can build up higher trough levels in certain areas of the brain, of the cranial nerves, or, and sometimes also in the peripheral nerve system. And, uh, you know, hyperbaric oxygen is a, uh, is a very good support in patients with serious forms of um, uh, cognitive dysfunction, means brain fog, yeah, and um, a specific affection of some of the cranial nerves. But uh, not as a standalone. Uh, it's most effective if you a patient are on any good forms of antimicrobial treatment, and then it's fully recommendable to go for these trials. Okay, thank you so much for for the, your time. Thank thank you so much for your uh, advices and uh, and uh, determination to to try to help uh, Lyme patients. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je pense qu'on peut l'applaudir. So. Um, I have to thank you uh, for the invitation, and it was really exciting um, uh, evening and presentation. And you know, um, as I said at the beginning, so I like more uh, these open discussion with many many different questions, and uh, because this is, um, I guess, uh, very interesting for patient uh, to get a better understanding where we are. And uh, and again. Um, uh, I was excited when you invited me, and it was a pleasure tonight um, uh, uh, to be a part of your uh, Lyme Awareness Month. And I hope, um, you know, I have treated so many patients from France uh, in my former clinic, and I'm still seeing a lot of French patients. And um, I wish everyone in France the best. Um, and I be sure I'm doing uh, also my best to convince doctors to stay on track um, even in France. Um, so um, uh, we need more and more doctors who are really committed and willing to learn about these tick-borne diseases. And everyone can get uh, the skills um, if there's some interest, if there's some uh, commitment. And, you know, I have shown at the beginning uh, the situation uh, that France is one of the hotspots in Europe. Um, there are so many areas of really high endemic um, uh, 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 situation. So uh, we need proper French doctors being focused on tick-borne diseases. And if I can contribute uh, uh, to this, I'm happy to do so. Yeah. And just one little anecdote, not anecdote, but joke. You know, when you started speaking, you, you said you we met two weeks ago, which is true, actually. Uh, in, in Munich, in Munich, actually, yeah, and uh, it was translated. You didn't notice that, but it was translated. We met at the conference for the eyelids, uh, and so of course it's a conference of eyelids, which is totally different. Donc c'est pas une conférence sur les paupières à laquelle on a assisté. Je tiens quand même à le dire parce que c'est quand même ça a rien à voir. C'est une conférence de eyelids qui a été traduite par eyelids, qui sont les paupières. Perhaps it's une petite blague. And, and another uh, wink for you uh, is that in two weeks' time, no, 15th of May, so in, yeah, 10 days from now, next Wednesday, actually, Wednesday yeah. next week, we have a new webinar coming with someone you may have crossed in your career, the doctor Pierre Yves Marion, yeah. a French doctor. You, you've been yeah. uh, working yeah. with him for, for years. And uh, donc, euh, je donne rendez-vous à tout le monde à ce, cette conférence que le docteur Pierre, euh, docteur, il n'est plus docteur, il n'exerce plus en tant que docteur, mais en tant que coach Lyme. Donc, ouais. euh, il a été docteur, il a été médecin généraliste en France et, et, et aussi à l'étranger. Donc, euh, et que vous avez bien connu, euh, docteur Nicolas Hauss. Ah, Donc, je donne rendez-vous à tout le monde le mercredi 15 à 18h30. Cette fois-ci, ça sera plus simple. Il n'y aura pas de sous-titres, ça sera en français. It's going to be in French. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, you did a great job because all you said you said was correctly translated and the system more or less worked right maybe sometimes too many words at the same time for the system for our brain you know but um, i think it was pretty good actually uh, uh, just my, my my last words so uh, dr marion uh, worked in our clinic and uh, we had been um, very very sad when he left the clinic going back to france but uh, there was a certain need to do so yeah, he was homesick, I think. That's it. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, of course. And um, yeah, uh, we are we are still um, uh, affiliated to each other. And, you know, 
Um, so he learned a lot in the clinic and he's still uh, providing um, uh, these alternative treatment regimens, uh, which had been uh, 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 um, the basic treatment in the BCA clinic, in the former BCA clinic. So the loop is 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 looped, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> boucle, yeah. Boucle, ouais. Merci à vous, Dr. Karsten Nicolaos. Merci à vous tous d'avoir euh, eu la, comment dirais-je, la, la patience d'attendre que tout ça fonctionne et puis de, de, de vous être un peu accroché au sous-titre. Je sais que c'est un c'est un exercice difficile, mais c'était intéressant. Well, thank you so much, and hopefully see you soon somewhere in the future. Okay, thank you so much. Have a nice day, uh, nice evening now. Yeah. I Bonsoir. Will. Bonsoir à tous. Bonsoir à tous. Au revoir.